Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters, welcome back to a very special episode. This is the second in a three-part series on doing with the Trustees of Reservations. The Trustees is a conservation organization based in Massachusetts. The focus of this series is on coastal adaptation and conservation. In our first episode, we focused on Waysquee Beach, which is on Martha's Vineyard. This episode is looking at Crane Beach, just north of Boston and outside Ipswich. I originally planned to travel to Massachusetts to record in person like I normally do, but with the onset of COVID-19, just about everyone's plans changed. That said, with a podcast, we have the luxury of recording from a distance, and I was able to interview experts and stakeholders about Crane Beach and the adaptation efforts underway. This podcast is being funded by the trustees, which is doing this as part of their communication efforts from a Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management grant they received. So thanks to the trustees and to CZM for funding the series. We'll have one additional episode, which will return us to Martha's Vineyard and talk about adaptation challenges at North Point Beach. These are just several of many land holdings that the trustees manage and preserve. I'm going to take you behind the scenes on how they are adapting their properties to climate change. This is our chance to go on the ground in coastal Massachusetts and hear how people want their coastal zone managed and what steps they're willing to take to protect and adapt these areas to existing and future impacts of climate change. This was an exciting opportunity to talk with people from coastal Massachusetts and how this region is approaching climate change. Yes, as I said before, I was extremely disappointed that I didn't get to go in person, but concerning what's going on in the world, I consider myself very lucky to get a chance to talk to these folks and share their stories here on the podcast. And you, my listeners, will think you're there on the beach, waves lapping, wind blowing in your hair. First off, Tom O'Shea, the Director of Coastal Conservation and Natural Resources at the Trustees, returns to give us some background on the grant they received and what's going on at Crane's Beach before a few more local stakeholders join me to share their own experiences on what's happening to the beach. All right, let's take a journey to Crane's Beach in Massachusetts. Hey, Adapters, I'm here with Tom O'Shea. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the podcast. Great. Thanks a lot, Doug. Glad to be here. This is part of this three-episode arc that I'm doing with you guys at the Trustees. But again, let's talk about the Trustees. Who are you guys? Well, the Trustees of Reservations, we're the largest land trust, or I should say even oldest land trust in the United States. And we are a land trust in Massachusetts, and we conserve and preserve properties all over the state. And we have over 30 coastal properties that protect and manage 76 miles of coast and another 40 in conservation restrictions. So it makes us one of the largest, well, it makes us the largest private landowner of coastline. And I think it makes us the second largest landowner of coastline in the state. So You know, we're uh, certainly very keen to be looking at, you know, what are the changes that we're going to see in our coastline from climate. Okay, so what is your specific role with the trustees? So my role is program director for coast and natural resources. And over the last two or three years, I've been helping to lead our coastal strategy, which is very new for the trustees. And that's, you know, one of the reasons I'm here today. What is the trustees coastal vision and why is that important for a land conservation group like yours? Right. We think the coastal strategy and vision is really important in many ways because what it will do is start to anticipate and start to chart a course forward for how we adapt and respond to coastal change, particularly for those things that are driven by climate impact, sea level rise and storm surge. And I think it's so important because I think the choices that we make and what we do to adapt can be models that others can look to and think about as maybe signals of how we can all respond on the coast. So we're hoping to be, you know, a champion for coastal resiliency and climate adaptation. And I think that we have a great opportunity, a pivotal moment in time where, you know, what we do today will, while there's still time, you know, can start setting the course for making choices before it's too late. I mean, after 2050, we start to see from the projections, it really takes off. And so this is the time. So you'd mentioned coastal resiliency and it's, you know, adaptation is this emerging issue. But what does coastal resilience mean to you? Yeah, I mean, that's that's always a a great question because I think it means different things to different people. But one of the ways we think about resiliency is that, you know, the system, whether it's a beach or a salt marsh, has an ability to respond and still function to the changes that are likely to occur. So they can bounce back, they can handle some of the storm events, they can handle sea level rise. 
and still function and provide the values that we, you know, preserve them for, whether it's habitat or public recreation, public access. And so for us, that's what we see as resiliency. If they, you know, if they no longer function and we're losing them, that that isn't resiliency, right? And and if we do something that doesn't accept change, we think we're going to protect against change, not accommodate it, that might not be resiliency either. You know, we're sort of in that middle area where we're accommodating change and allow, you know, ho- hopefully intervening to, you know, help these areas adapt to that change. All right. So the, the definition of resilience is sort of a moving target. And you know, I think different regions have their own definitions. And I'm sure you probably work with your partners as you ultimately are trying to define what that means for you. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, how you define it, you know, resiliency for a road may be different you know, way of defining it for salt marsh or coastal habitat. So, and there are obviously very real professional definitions around what resiliency is, but that ability to, you know, handle disturbance and change and come and, and bounce back or, or change in a way that still allows you to function, allows the system to function, that is resiliency. I appreciate what you're doing here. You have a coastal zone management grant, and I want you to give a little bit of background, but I certainly want to put a plug in that I appreciate that your organization and then even CZM looked at podcasts as a potential way to communicate what you're doing. So, you know, kudos to you guys, but could you give some context of what this grant is all about? Sure. The Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management is really the lead agency that you know, it's their mission and purview to oversee coastal zone management. And one of the ways that they saw, you know, the trustees and, and we also saw the opportunity is that, you know, we engage over a half a million people that come to our beaches and many, many other people in the communities where we have properties and through our public programs, you know, that we can really touch and reach a lot of people on issues and challenges on on our coastal communities and particularly in this case, publicly accessible shorelines. So this particular grant and what we're talking about today is about, you know, how do we still allow for and ensure public access to the coast when many, you know, these public access areas, whether it's public roads or parking lots or boardwalks to the beach, you know, are going to be impacted because they're on the front lines. They're usually within a few feet of sea level. So they're on the front lines of change, whether it's sea level rise and storms. So this was a great opportunity for the Coastal Zone Management Agency, who we've you know truly appreciated and are grateful for the support they've given to us to take you know our properties and use them as a case study you know and as a model to say, all right, here here are the impacts you know here are the measures that we could take and then get stakeholders, local stakeholders, to provide their perspective on you know how, how what kind of measures would you be supportive of? What do you think? Uh, what should we do here? And in doing so, we're basically living you know the realities here of climate change. And so this is a great opportunity for us to use our property as a case study. And your podcast, Doug, is a great, rich you know way to really allow people to hear and listen to perspectives that they may not have heard other otherwise. And hopefully we provide people with some learning. So Doug, great to have you. I mean, your America Adapt program and podcast series, you know, really tackle climate change beyond what we are at the national level and the national stage. So certainly fortunate to have you as part of the project, Doug. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Today in this episode, we're talking about Crane Beach. And if you could give a little bit of background of where Crane Beach is in relationship to, I guess, other properties, but you're using Crane as a living laboratory to study vulnerabilities of publicly accessible shorelines, and you're investigating potential adaptation methods. So why is this type of shoreline a focus and what does it face in the coming years and what can be done to protect it? Yeah, great, great question. So Crane Beach has, you know, been for many years, been with the trustees since 1945, and it's a destination place, a destination beach in Massachusetts, and it's even made national rankings of one of the best beaches in the country. So it's certainly a wonderful place. It's spectacular. It's beautiful. We attract 350,000 visitors to Crane Beach each year. And there's one way into that beach right now. If you're driving from far away, and that's Argilla Road, that's the one road that goes to Crane Beach, And as you're driving, you know, you get down to that lower elevation where you see these, you know, magical salt marshes on either side of you and the views open up and you know you're you can smell the salt air and you're you're getting close to the beach. And those roadways now from, you know, when we looked at a coastal vulnerability assessment with Woods Hole Group and they did these hydrodynamic models to look at, well, what will sea level rise do to the flooding of this road in the future? And we found that after the year 2030, 
only about 10 years away, you know, we're going to see almost daily tidal flooding that road. And that's sunny day flooding is the term people have used. And what a you know, loss for everybody if we can't get people to the beach back and forth, especially this time of year, because of daily tidal flooding. So we're trying to get ahead of that. But also we're finding that even now when they looked at the vulnerability of flooding in the parking lot and the facilities, and we were even thinking about retrofitting one area and creating a coastal education center. So this we thought, wow, there's a lot going on here. We've got the parking lot, Argilla Road, and these are areas that you know going to be potentially flooded. The parking lot's more storm events rather than sea level rise, but still. And then we've got the boardwalk that takes people over the beach. And we have been adapting that boardwalk now for for decades where, you know, the sands and the dunes have been building, which is a good thing. And we've had to rebuild over the old, you know, boardwalks to get people to, you know, the beach without trampling the, you know, fragile beach and dune environment and grass vegetation, the beach grass. So, We've created these boardwalks. So we thought, wow, there's a lot happening here. You know, we also have a, a road that goes out to a dock where people can go to the beautiful Chote Island, which is where they filmed the Crucible movie uh, many years ago. But, you know, this is a very historic island. So there's so many great places here. And if you can't get to them in the future easily, it's a real loss for everyone. So that was the focus here is let's use our situation as a case study, public access to the coast. And let me tell you, Doug, that there are a lot of you know roads in Massachusetts that are at the terminus, right? They're, they end at the coastal shoreline. And before you get there, they're within a few feet of sea level. So Argilla Road's one of many situations like that in Massachusetts, probably in other states as well. The trustees organized a workshop around Crane Beach. What was the purpose of the workshop and who did you recruit to attend? Right. We held a workshop on what are the impacts to the Crane Beach area. And we held this workshop to not only, you know, ask local stakeholders to become more aware of these impacts, but to provide their input and perspectives on what could be done about it. You know, what would they like to see? And so we all what we did is presented various adaptation measures that are either in the works or we'd like to consider in various alternatives and then say, OK, what do people think? Well, you know, should we act or not? You know, I mean, these will take investments, take serious investments to do some of these adaptations. So we want to get a sense of what people would would think. And, you know, I mean, right now there's the choice in many of these areas is you either adapt or you relocate. Right. And so we wanted to hear what people had to say. And by doing so, you know, we'll be able to communicate these perspectives and and I think provide other communities and other landowners, coastal beach managers with, OK, here's some reactions from stakeholders where we are. It could be similar to what you might experience or hear in your own community. So that was really the workshops. Give a chance for everybody to react to, you know, what are we going to do here? How do we respond to coastal change and climate? And we're going to be hearing from some of the participants of the workshop coming up after my interview with you. But what were your overall impressions from the feedback from the workshop? Do you think people were happy with the information you were sharing? Was there a lot of productive information that you're going to be able to use as an organization? Yeah, we got some great input in from people who are very much engaged in issues and concerns of climate in the area around Ipswich, which is the town that uh, Crane Beach is located in. I mean, I think we heard from a lot of people who are particularly sensitive to, you know, environmental impacts. They did probably wonder, you know, is there a way that you can bring people to the beach without having them drive there, which means can you set up alternative parking and shuttles or some other way rather than investing in the road or investing in the parking lot to become more resilient, you know, just have people park further back or something. So we did hear that. That was sort of one end of the spectrum, you know, and then there were others, stakeholders, you know, like the town officials that, you know, realized that, you know, if we can make some adaptations to this road that is good for habitat and helps to minimize flooding from daily tidal cycles, then let's do it. And they they've partnered with us, the trustees, to you know really create a statewide model for how we might adapt road roadways to sea level rise. From that perspective, I think we're on track to make an adaptation that can provide benefits for up to 50 years. And buy time, you know, and create access for a whole generation of people and kids and families. So 
you know, from that perspective, if, uh, I think we heard that, yeah, it may be worth the, in, you know, worth the investment. You know, and likewise, we heard the same about the parking lot. And, you know, maybe even if we can create an adaptive design for a coastal education center, you know, that that would be really interesting. Could provide a model for other people who have, you know, buildings or homes and in those types of areas that are susceptible to storm, storm events. We heard a range during this time of COVID-19, it's been difficult to get the kind of participation at times, particularly at that time when we had the workshop in early May, there was a lot going on. And so we, you know, we might have got more participation, I think, if we had held it on site, but we did as the best we can. And, you know, we've heard some good feedback. So I think it'll be interesting to share this with others. And it's certainly been helpful for us to think through the various perspectives that we're hearing. All right. So coming up are some of those interviews from officials that live in the community there and that work on the the road there specifically, and then just concerned uh, community members that participate in the workshop. Tom, you're going to come back at the end of this episode, and we're going to touch base, and we're going to kind of do a wrap-up. So, Tom, I'll see you on the other side. Great. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Doug. Hey, Adapters. I'm here with Peter Pinciaro. Hi, Peter. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thank you. We are talking about Crane Beach and the Crane property. So what's your role with the trustees? Doug, I'm the director of the Crane Estate for the Trustees of Reservation. So I oversee the entire operation at both Crane Beach and Castle Hill and a handful of other smaller sites scattered across the North Shore. Got a staff of about 12 people. And uh, we welcome over the course of 12 months, about 350,000 visitors here. It's uh, actually the busiest property in the trustees portfolio. How long have you lived in that area? I grew up on the North Shore up in Beverly, and I've lived in Ipswich since 1982. So you you have a longstanding relationship with this area and this property, right? I mean, just you grew up going and visiting this, uh, this resource. That's exactly right, Doug. I, uh, my dad brought me here uh, when I was about 13 to fish for striped bass out in the out in the marshes behind Crane Beach, unbeknownst to me exactly where uh, we were at the time. So I have been uh, familiar with Crane and its resources for a long time. If you could just quickly tell me, did your dad get you smoking cigars at an early age? <laughs> he did, actually. So we'd be out on the Castle Neck River uh, with horseshoe crabs tickling my bare feet because I, you know, I didn't have waders at the time because I was I was young, and uh, these little insects come out at dusk and dawn, call them midges locally, and they get in your ears and in your scalp and up your nose, and they bite. My dad was a cigar smoker only when he fished, and he <laughs> handed me he used to hand me cigars to help uh, keep the bugs off because they do not like smoke. Oh man, that's a new one. So you're there, but you're dealing with the property, but do you actually interact with the public much? I do. Yeah. I, it's one of the things uh, that really c- kind of keeps me grounded and, and helps me to uh, stay in touch with, with the reasons that I got into uh, land conservation as a career. I find it really rewarding you know, to see the joy that people glean from you know, being on sites like this. And I, and I know that I have many, many colleagues at the trustees that that feel the same way. So I, I, I do make it a point to make sure that I get out on the ground to interact with visitors and, and uh, you know, talk with our staff and make sure that we're all uh, providing the best possible experience for visitors. And I, and, well, I think it reflects well on the trustees uh, when we behave that way. So this episode is about climate change and how your beach is going to adapt to climate change. When it comes to the public, does this come up much from them? Do they bring it up with you or is it something that you bring up with them? How does that work? I think it's increasingly coming up with them because we've got four miles of waterfront and the majority of of our visitors at some point will traverse the beach on foot. And when they go to the east, so in other words, when they get out into the swim area and they walk to the right, the evidence of erosion is is really quite dramatic. So I, I think increasingly people are aware that Crane Beach is under threat if they're energetic enough to get all the way to the mouth of the Essex River, where the change has been most dramatic, it's readily apparent. And on some days, um, and there, there are many more of them um, than there were as, as, re- as recently as you know five years ago, the tidal water comes up over the access road in front of the gates. And you know, particularly in the, the shoulder seasons in winter, people either have to turn around or uh, drive through six or eight inches of salt, uh, salt water racing across the paved road. This is private property though, right? It's mostly private property. The town of Ipswich owns, a, owns about a 20-acre piece, but largely the 2,000 acres is uh, protected forever. In regards to public access, what are the biggest issues that you're hearing? 
In terms of public access, I actually haven't gotten a lot of feedback from visitors that they feel as though their ability to access the beach is um, is threatened in the near term. I think the lion's share of our visitors, um, you know, spend most of their visit in in the swim area on the main beach that that actually looks like it's growing. So the you know there's lots of sand accreting on the on the main beach um, because of, you know some of the dynamic you know forces that are happening just just offshore. So I think that there is a relative sense of security. And I'm actually quite excited that the trustees are rather dramatically raising their profile in terms of communicating what's at stake to our visitors. And we're going to see some of those first steps um, in the next two or three weeks down at the beach. When you're dealing with the beach, it's, it's always a changing system, but I'm sure you've done your own homework. What is climate change, sea level rise ultimately going to mean for you? How does that affect what you do today? What, do you, what are you thinking about? And you think when you're talking with your staff, how does that come up? It really doesn't have a huge effect on us on a day-to-day basis right now, but I think what we are realizing is that the the notion of people being able to come to the beach on a whim will increasingly not be practical. As a manager, and and I know you know the managers that succeed me are in all likelihood really going to have to manage based on tides. There are some steps that the organization is is taking in partnership with the town to try and you know assure a certain level of access for the future. But if you could just imagine a future manager having to decide whether to open or close the beach on a particular day because the tide was going to be over the road for, you know, an hour or two hours and that, and the depth would be such that cars, you know, wouldn't be able to even leave the property. So it creates some, some rather complex challenges. And, and over time, you know, if things don't change, the size of the beach will get smaller and smaller. There'll be more energy, you know, spit forth out of these winter storms. So there'll be much, much more damage. It may be that we to, um, you know, continue to retreat from the beach and start to think about, you know, alternative parking, you know, would the facilities be located on on higher ground. So those are all decisions that future managers are are going to have to make. I think I think Crane Beach will be here for for a long, long time. I mean, you know, for the next couple of hundred years, uh, from from my perspective. But it will be dramatically different, and it, it may only be accessible by a, you know over Castle Hill, and the audience could be considerably smaller based on the you know the size of the beach. Sometimes this is actually hard to do, but you have this unique history coming to this beach for a long time. Have you noticed any changes? Oh, dramatic. Yeah, I mean, particularly to the east of uh, the main swim area, the configuration of the sandbars has changed. And if you, if you look at aerial photos, it's just really interesting to see where all of the sand that's been you know, picked up from the beach and deposited. There's a scientist that's been studying here for years. He calls them that there's an ebb tidal delta, and then there's another delta associated with the rising tide. It's really interesting to see kind of the sand fans. They literally looks like a big sand a sand fan from the air, how all that sand is just sitting offshore that was formerly on the beach. And when that sand was up on the beach, it was a considerable barrier that protected the, you know, the salt marshes. You know, the salt marshes are arguably the most productive ecosystem in the world. You know, the barrier beach protects their very viability. It's been really quite dramatic uh, to, to the east. And, you know, there's some storms will we'll go to certain portions, you know, one and a half, 1.75 miles down to the, to the east. And we'll see we will lose 75 feet of beachfront and dune in one storm. So the the change, uh, I've always referred to it as fast track geology. Most geological forces are are not visible to the human eye. They they, they take so long for them to happen unless you're on a beach. You know, the geology changes almost on a daily basis, depending upon which way the wind is blowing and what its velocity is. Why is Crane Beach important to you? I wax poetic here on Crane Beach. I've always felt that Crane Beach, it's a timeless environment. It's a place that generations can go to reconnect with their loved ones and their childhood, reconnect with nature. There's, there's just so many wonderful feelings, I think, that a barrier beach like Crane generates. You know, the smells, the sounds. I think people just find it incredibly soothing. I guess those are the key things that I, I, I pull out of the beach. But, but I also really appreciate the beach's resiliency. When you look at its ability to recover from so much adversity, these plants get washed out, you know, in a late spring storm and, you know, they, they take root in the rack line and now they're, now they're growing again. There's just so many forces that are working against it. 
yet it seems to prevail all the time. So I think it's it's really kind of inspirational, you know, to watch how stoic a barrier beach is under those circumstances. Great answer. Final question. Do you have a favorite spot on the property? <laughs> I do. So I have a favorite spot. I, I hate to reveal it because, well, I, I actually can't imagine that it would ever get crowded because it's out at the Crane Wildlife Refuge portion of the Crane Estate on Chode Island. If a visitor gets out to the, the island by boat on their own or on, on one of our tours, they should walk up past the White Cottage, past the 1740 Chode House, up the hill to the burial site of his uh, son, Cornelius Crane, and his wife, Mine, the donors of the property. Halfway up the hill, visitors should turn around, look out over Essex Bay. The view literally changes by the hour. You could see, you know, tidal flat, salt marsh, almost the entire of Castle Neck, so known as Crane Beach. You can look off to Cape Ann. It's like being in a time capsule, actually. I think it takes me back 200 years ago. It's the best view in our entire trustees collection, as far as I'm concerned. So that would be my destination if I were to pick just one spot. Well, Peter, this has been fantastic. I've I've learned a lot. Thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure, Doug. Thank you. Hey, Adapters. I'm here with Sandy Tilton. Hi, Sandy. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Doug. Nice to be here. Okay, so I'm interviewing you for this Crane Beach podcast, but what's your relationship with Crane Beach? I grew up in Ipswich, and most of my life was spent wandering and loving Crane's Beach and the whole area. I moved away for a number of years, but always wanted to come back, and I've been back for probably... 15 years or so, and I'm never leaving again. (laughs) Over the course of my lifetime, I've watched things change. And recently, over the past few years, there's been a huge change. But I just love it. It It's my understanding that you're known for being a photographer and you, you photograph the beach quite often? Yes, I do. I've been into photography for quite a while. And over the past 10 years or so, I've really gotten into it as a serious, just more than just a hobby. The past five or six years, I helped out with a group called Storm Surge, which is based out of Newburyport, and helped photograph and document the erosion on Plum Island and used that knowledge that I gained from doing that in looking at observing what's going on over at Cranes Beach. I guess there's just been an evolution. You, I mean, I'm assuming you're going out, you're taking pictures of just the landscape and wildlife, but now there's this extra documenting the changes that are occurring. Yes. And as a photographer, if you go back and, I mean, a photographer looks at things a little bit differently than the average person does, I think. And when you're trying to document the erosion, you tend to go to the same spot area over and over again so that you can see the changes and your focal point is on the same spot or at least that's what I've always tried to do when I was documenting for the erosion so it it makes it very easy to see and it becomes just a way that you look at things going forward. (laughs) Let's say there's a particular area at the beach that you're photographing on a regular basis what sort of changes are you seeing? I see that the sand is shifting on cranes. And recently, over the past few months, being away um, because of the COVID-19 situation and going back recently, I've seen that there's changes that have occurred just in the past three or four months. The sand has shifted. There's more sand building on the sandbars out beyond the shores of cranes in Plum Island Sound and in front of the beach, which always makes changes the way the currents carry the sand in and changes the the way the sand accretes on the beach and the way it erodes and just changes the entire shape of the beach. Now, you were recommended by the folks at the trustees. Are you a member? What's your involvement with the group? I'm a member of the trustees, and I do some volunteer work with them on occasion as I can, helping out with the walking tours over on Chode Island. Now, you must hear them talk more about climate change, about adapting to climate change. What do you think of that when you hear them talk about those things? Well, I'm one of those people that having observed what I've observed, I think that they everyone needs to spend more time learning about how to adapt to what's happening. By using Mother Nature and and watching how Mother Nature makes the adaptation and using that information when we make decisions as to how what we're going to do. Are we going to retreat? 
Are we going to compromise and in our in the way that we adapt? Now, one of the big issues for Crane Beach is uh, public access. How does that affect you? And what do you hear from other people that actually use the beach when it comes to public access? Is there less access now? The access points are becoming stressed. Argilla Road, um, I know they're working on currently a plan to raise it because when the high tides come in, it happens more and more often. You, Argilla Road gets flooded, so access to the beach from the main parking area, from the main entrance spot, is going to be affected more and more as time goes on. There are a couple trails along the end of Crane's Beach over at Cedar Point, which has always been accessible for walking, whether it was high tide, low tide, whatever. It, it's, it was a rare thing that you couldn't walk that path that goes along the marsh out to Cedar Point towards the mouth of the Ipswich River. And now every high tide, it floods and it's not accessible. And it's not just that it's ankle deep water. It's becoming like calf deep. That limits the accessibility there. And also with all the erosion on the far end on the where the Essex River comes out, the amount of sand that's been lost in the dunes that have eroded is just incredible. Just incredible. It's almost unbelievable. As a child, we used to take pieces of cardboard or, you know, the flying metal flying saucers and slide down the dunes. They were so huge. And all those dunes are gone. They're just gone. So you've been documenting this with your your camera. Now, you obviously take an interest as the, the ecosystem, as this landscape changes. Are there other beaches and other parts of the country that you sort of, you are seeing similar things? Are you, do you kind of follow that at all as you kind of document this at Crane Beach? Yes, for a number. Well, Plum Island, of course, is right across the Plum Island Sound at the end of Crane Beach. And that's affected just as severely. And all along the coast of Salisbury and Seabrook, New Hampshire, is just everything is being affected. The shape of the beach changes. and I think. But it's almost like a it's almost like an echo where one beach is altered and I think it affects the currents and then changes everything. And the amount of accessibility or the way that we access the beaches is changing also because of that, because the sand is disappearing. The water is higher and we have to adjust to that. Now, the trustees have started a process where they're communicating with stakeholders and users of the beach on how they're going to help the beach adapt to climate change. Have you been able to weigh in on any of that? Yes, we did a workshop recently through Zoom, which was excellent, an excellent presentation. And I believe there were 20 some odd of us that attended virtually. And it was very informative about the changes, the things that they're contemplating. So they are taking a positive approach as far as pinpointing what needs to have the most attention quickly and how to make those adaptations or should we retreat and how long will any adjustments that we make last and be worthwhile. Things like the store, the parking lot, Argilla Road, of course, and the boathouse, which is on the back side of Cranes across from Chode Island by the Essex River. Do you have a favorite photograph of Crane Beach that you've taken, and what is it? Ah, <laughs> I have many favorite photographs of Crane Beach. I think my favorite photograph is there is a huge dune that still exists. It's getting smaller, and it's really only accessible from the Dunes Trail on the Essex end of Crane's Beach. And as a kid, it was we called it the Mother Dune because it was the largest dune that was there, and it's still the largest dune. And it's it's just very impressive. And there's a you can access it from Castle Neck River, which is behind Crane's between Crane's Beach and Hog Island. And there's a trail that comes in through the back there, and it's just a very dramatic, picturesque viewpoint. And and it just shows how important, I think, the dunes are to the environment and to protecting 
everything. All right. You might have just answered this question, but if not, if you have a different spot. So what is your favorite spot on the beach? Even though you had that favorite photograph, is that the same thing? No, my favorite spot, I think, is on Beat Hill Beach, which is near where the the shipwreck of the Ada K. Damon, which was a schooner that sunk there in 1909 and is now probably the most uncovered I've ever seen it. And that's another indication that the sands are shifting and the shape of the beach is the contours of the beach is changing. But that is probably my very favorite spot. I spent a lot of time. My father worked at Castle Hill when I was a kid. And so I got the opportunity to spend a lot of time up there and to play. <laughs> it was like my own little playground. And I just love that whole area dearly. Perfect. Well, Sandy, that that's awesome. I, I appreciate you weighing in here and thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Doug. It's been my pleasure. Hey, Adapters. I'm here with Jim Engel. Hi, Jim. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Doug. Glad to be here. All right. We're talking about Crane Beach. First off, what's your relationship with Crane Beach and I, the trustees? Well, my relationship started quite a while ago. I was a, a member of the Board of Selectmen here in Ipswich for some 15 years. And as a member of the Board of Selectmen, I took a notion that we ought to improve the relationship of the municipal government with the trustees of reservations. And so I began to pay attention to that involvement. So over the course of the years, I became active uh, on a couple of different committees associated with Castle Hill and, and the trustees of reservation properties here in Ipswich. My relationship probably goes back, oh, 25 years. Obviously, you're a longtime resident of the Crane Beach area. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I live in Ipswich, and, of course, Crane Beach is in Ipswich. So I've lived in Ipswich since 1976. So you, you're in a good position to see sort of the changes that have occurred. So are you a regular user of the beach? Do you get to go out there frequently? Well, I'm a, I'm a wintertime beach person. I don't like the beach in the summertime for the crowds and the heat and the bugs and that sort of thing. So I tend to enjoy the beach most in the winter. Wow, you are. Your hearty soul, yes. What are some of the emerging issues for public access for Crane Beach? I know the trustees are, are really approaching this on their concern about sea level rise, concern about climate change. What do you see this meaning for public access for the beach? Sea level rise and climate change, is those are issues that are sort of in the future, but perhaps not too far in the future. The main issues tend to be, from the Ipswich perspective, is crowds and traffic and Utilization of the beach during the summertime can sometimes be uh, problematic because there are just too many people that uh, come come to the beach. So, you know, it's a one way in, one way out uh, to the beach. It's a long, long, long road. And part of it is susceptible to flooding so that at times of, of the month where there's king tides and certain conditions, uh, the road becomes impassable, which is seems to be the focus of a lot of people at this point is to sort of correct that problem. I think the main road there is they are looking at elevating that. And is, it, is that controversial with folks there? For Jilla Road, I think there's, there's a notion that although, you know, you can see the need for doing something, that the, the expense of raising a roadway for convenience of just a few hours a, a day, maybe two or three times a year, just seems to be like like a lot of money spent uh, to solve a problem, which is not that great. There are some other issues, of course, that you're raising the rate. Goes, the road does go through the salt marsh, and the environmental issues associated with raising the roadway become a part of the discussion. In order to minimize the impact on, on the marsh by raising the road, the road is not going to have much in the way of shoulders and will become not very friendly to pedestrians and to bikers. That's going to be a major discussion point, I think, as, as, they, as they look at raising the, raising the road. Is the local city mainly responsible for funding these renovations to the road, or is the trustees as a private entity responsible? Well, it's probably going to be some of both at the end of the day. I think that that community doesn't see the need as compelling as the trustees uh, see, see the need. I think that the community is would probably, if if it were only the community that was that was involved, I think the community would probably not go ahead with it. But the trustees, you know, the reality is Crane Beach is is a major money maker for the trustees. 
and keeping access to the beach to keep that financial arrangement uh, in good order is, is much more important to the trustees than to the town. I'm not sure if I caught your name. Were you participating in the recent workshop? Yes. What was your impression of the different information that w- they were sharing, I guess, problems that are coming up? Well, I, I think they all, you know, all, of, all the problems are legitimate to some extent or another. I think that uh, priority is there's probably a higher priority to the tr- for the trustees to solve the uh, access problem than for the municipal to solve the access problem. But they're all you know, legitimate needs. Why is Crane Beach so important to you? Well, I, I think that Crane Beach somewhat def- is, is part of the fabric of, of Ipswich. It's, I wouldn't say it's you know, totally defining of Ipswich, but you know, when one thinks of Ipswich, you think of the beach. And that's, you know, if you go around the Commonwealth and ask, you know, people say, oh, you live in Ipswich. Oh, yeah, Crane Beach. I mean, it, it is the, the, the thing that most people think of when they think of Ipswich is Crane Beach. It's pretty defining as, as a community asset. Do you have a favorite spot at Crane Beach? Where there aren't any people. <laughs> so it's a moving target, but that's a great answer. And that's why I like it in the winter. It's because there are very few people on the beach and, and it's quiet and it's just sort of a wholesome place to be. All right, Jim. Thank you so much for your feedback and thank you for coming on. Oh, you're welcome, Doug. Hey, Adapters. I'm here with Frank Ventimiglia. Hi, Frank. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate you joining me here, and I, I, I want to talk about Crane Beach. And first off, what's your relationship there? What do you do? You work for the city of Ipswich? Yes. So I work for the town of Ipswich, DPW department, uh, responsible for the roads and public property in Ipswich. As such, the road leading up to Crane Beach is the responsibility of the town and the DPW department. It's leading up to the beach, but when it actually goes on the property, you you don't have any responsibility? The town owns a small piece of the beach. The Crane Estate or the Cranes gifted the town a portion of the beach and a portion of the parking lot, but managed by a division of the, D, of the DPW, but not under my umbrella personally. Okay, so how, how long have you lived in that area? Born and raised in Gloucester, Mass., which is two towns away. Grew up there in the 80s. Now I'm working here in Ipswich, just a couple towns away. So I've kind of been on the North Shore basically my entire life, with the exception of apologies. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what's happening there. They're dealing with issues of sea level rise and storm events and the, the road there. They're having to rethink it. And you went to the recent trustees workshop where they were talking about climate change and adapting to climate change. So what was your thoughts on that workshop? So a good workshop, just highlighting, I think, what a lot of us in coastal communities are seeing, which is, you know, increased flooding from tidal events and just from sea level rise. And it's dealing with that aspect of it that we're trying to address over at Adjula Road. And as you know, it's not that's not the only road in town that floods. It's just one that came up as a high priority for the trustees. And it teamed up well with what the town's long term hazard mitigation plans are and flood mitigation plans are. Now, are you guys factoring? And because, you know, a, a big emphasis in that workshop was the climate change. And so that could be 10, 30, 50 years out. Is the city, as you'd mentioned, dealing with other roads that are having flooding issues? Are those long term things being factored into the work that you're doing? Yes. And I think it's something that we look at at each road now. Uh, we're actually raising us another road across town, Jeffrey's Neck Road. Same reason it floods periodically get more frequent. And we need to address it. You know, seems now seems to be the time to start looking at it because it's ready to be repaved. So we've been investigating that one as well. And how often do you think you'll have to actually elevate the road? Is this with the proposals that are kind of going out right now? Is this a 20 year solution? What, what, what are you hearing? The engineering work that we're doing on Adjula Road, and I think it's pretty similar to Jeffrey's Neck Road. And we're looking to take it out to about 2070 and beyond is what they're. So I would say it's more like a 50 year project, hopefully, you know, hopefully at that point, either something has changed in our environment and sea level rise slows or we will need to be looking at, you know, the next option. It could be a bridge, could be, you know, maybe nothing we can do. and We have to retreat. But um, that's some of the things we're thinking of. I think sea level rise are going to keep people like you busy in the years ahead. So one of the things that came up, and if, if you could comment on it, is Argilla Road is 
Um, this notion of, you know, you've got marshland and you have to kind of consider the ecological considerations. And so this notion of a living shoreline, what, what, what does that mean? It allows for the salt marsh to migrate up or down, I would say. I know we all say up because sea level rise, you know, is coming and that's what we're planning for. But in the event that it, you know, rises for 20 or 30 years and subsides or then starts to, you know, reside a little, it allows for it to kind of move up and down the slope. You know, if it migrates up, great. If sea level rises, if it starts to level off, hopefully it levels off on the embankment. So it's kind of not putting a rock hardscape there where nothing can grow. It's planting and, and allowing the plant species to have an opportunity to move vertically up and down the embankment with the different salinity levels that come in with the sea level rise. That's a good thing, but factoring these ecological considerations in, does that make it more expensive to do these kind of road projects? I believe so, certainly at this juncture, because there's not enough, I guess, pre-existing data on it. So we are doing a lot of extra engineering work to, I think, determine what the best side slope percentages are and you know where it's i think we're doing stuff that hasn't been done so it costs more to figure it out i guess is the best way to say it in my mind now just this is more of just your own observations and if you you attended that workshop you see them talking about climate change and what it's going to mean for the landscape there and you said you would go to other beaches do you feel that the people in those communities around there are thinking about that do you hear that especially working with for the city Yes. And if any coastal community, at least up here, will tell you how valuable the beaches are, uh, especially in these current conditions that we're in. Access to the beach has become a, a big discussion point, I think, in most towns, because right now a lot of towns are limiting it to either just residents or trying to do limited residents and limited paying customers. You know, the beaches pay for a lot of the operating budgets. Uh, in these communities and a lot of them, particularly like in Gloucester, yeah, you know, they're closed for a while for the general public other than residents. So it, it highlighted the concern to have access to the beach for sure and how it may become problematic moving forward. I guess that's interesting in that the notion of even having access to the beach, not only sea level rise and these storm events, but just the, the amount of people that want to use it. So this, it'll only be available, I guess, for, for local residents. Not only, but just for local residents, increasingly so? Is that what you're kind of seeing? No, no, I'm seeing that just the effect that this COVID situation had to kind of, I've always said it's more people, you know, every day they turn people away from beaches on a good day. So there's not enough beach to go around for everyone, right, on a good day. I think this COVID crisis just highlighted that, how valuable this beach space is and how limited of a resource it is for the amount of people who want to be on it and use it. And I think with sea level rise, if we don't address it, it's going to, again, create a situation kind of like we see today that, you know, you have less opportunity to use the beach and more people than ever who want to use the beach. And just going back to Crane Beach, do you think what their plans are right now, this is sort of a, a practical approach to what they need to do going forward? I do. Um, I feel, again, this and the other road across town, if we do nothing, it floods more frequently today. It'll flood even more frequently in the future, which cuts off access to either that beach, Crane Beach in this instance. You know, you'll have days where it's nice out, but you can't get there. You know, where do you park? Where do we go? And how do they deal with that? So I think it helps solve that problem in the now and will allow the towns and cities to figure out, you know, if I solve the problem for 50 years today, we can't ignore the problem for 50 years. You know, we need to start thinking of the solution 50 years from now today because that's going to be an expensive, thoughtful solution. You know, I'm not going to be able to think of it in two years when the road's starting to fall apart again. If You know, so there really is, I think, it's a good stop gap for now and allows towns to do some real, real long-term planning, you know, hundred year planning to see if it makes sense to keep building these roads higher, making bridges if needed for access. You've been to Crane Beach at least a, a few times. Do you have a favorite spot on the beach? I don't. I haven't been there enough to, I certainly haven't been there enough to, to say that. I don't know where the best parts of the beach are around. You know, I know for me, my best parts are down near the water. I don't like to sit up in the hot sand. <laughs> 
but that's because I have a couple of kids that I got to chase around constantly too that want to be in the water the whole time. So, all right. Well, thanks, Frank. No problem. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I'm back with Tom. This is the end of the episode. We just heard from a variety of different folks. Obviously, very interested in what's going to happen to Crane Beach, and they participated in the workshop and some of the local officials who are helping do some of the management of the area. So, Tom, just as a wrap up here, what do you want the public to take from these findings that that this information that you're getting as part of this process? Yeah, I mean, I would like the public to, first of all, be aware that there is change coming and we have time. We have time to respond now to really ensure, you know, that we provide public access to our coastline and that there are going to be places that they love to go and visit and travel that if we don't respond, you know, could be more difficult in the future to access because of sea level rise. So let's make some choices today. Let's talk about it and let's figure out ways that we can still provide public access to our coastline you know, for the next generation, I think about my son, Brendan, and, I'm, you know, how is he going to get to Crane Beach and bring his family there in the future? And so, you know, I think we're buying time and options. You know, maybe his generation or beyond will say maybe make a different choice. But I think the time is now. This isn't something we wait for. And, you know, and we want to get people's perspective on it because it's going to take all of us really together to be supportive of these adaptation measures. It's going to be a big investment. It's going to take partnerships from private and public entities to make this happen. I really, you know, want people to be um, aware and more engaged and, and get their perspective. So we hope also that from what we learn from this, we can share with others that will be facing this same challenge along the coast. Just so you know, in multiple interviews, I kept mispronouncing Argilla Road. I was like Argilla, and every time they had to correct me, but I was able through some fancy editing to get my mispronunciations out. But I just did, yeah, I'm sure they were rolling their eyes. And no, no worries. You know what? Everybody who I would say that I've I've encountered who've come across this name of the road for the first time, Doug, probably pronounced it like you did. If that helps, there's there's company, good company with you. Don't even get me started on how I mispronounced way squee the first few times. But <laughs> all right. So as we wrap this up, you have all this great information. You have feedback that I think a lot of conservation groups would love to have. What's next for the trustees regarding Crane Beach? Yeah, so what's next? I mean, we've got um, this project underway right now, almost finishing up permitting for Argilla Road resiliency design at the end of this coming year. And then we're going to be into construction. And it's going to be a real question about how do we fund construction and how will that get done? We're talking a project that's anywhere between three and six million dollars to construct. And that's outside of the budgets of many communities. Certainly, I imagine Ipswich and and, and the trustees. So we're going to figure out, uh, all right, how are we going to fund this together and what sources of state or federal funding is there? We also are going to be thinking about a coastal education center and the parking lot. And so, you know, how will we design those to be you know, able to handle storm events in the future? So that's going to be an ongoing thing that we will share with people. And our coastal microsite is going to be a great place for people. This is um, the trustees on the coast dot org. Check that out. And we also, Doug, I, and I don't think I mentioned this at all in the workshop, but we will be putting in some coastal interpretive signage and uh, online information. So people on site will be able to learn more about what's happening you know, when they visit the property. We're trying to engage people and we have beach profiling team, the team of volunteers that are literally out there measuring the beach and the dunes and the shoreline change. And we're going to be reporting that data so that people can see these sort of fluctuations in the shoreline. We also hope to have more video uh, up there as well, you know, just showing, you know, what this area looks like and showing some of the changes that are likely to happen if we are successful with this project and how the habitat can change in the future by allowing more tidal flow under the road. So it's going to be dynamic. I mean, we're going to hopefully continue to engage people in how this area is changing and how we're responding. So this is like learning. Like you said, this is a living laboratory in action. More to come. I've been asking this of all the guests on the shows. What's your favorite spot on Crane Beach? 
Yes, I'm going to tell you in a way that, that I'm going to, it's like three different spots. So here's how it works. When you get, and, and I remember this as a kid, right? So I would travel to Crane Beach with either another family or my parents. And when you come over the crest of the hill down by Castle Hill, and then you get to, you know, that last final stretch of Argilla Road, you just see the marsh, the, the big salt marsh. You can smell the salt air. You see these gorgeous views on the left and on the right. It's just amazing. And then you, when you look on the right, before you get to the beach park, a lot you see Chode Island on the right and it's this beautiful hill and an island out there on the coast so that's experience number one and then you know and it's both a, a visual and then you can smell the salt air and you can feel the breeze and then you get to the beach parking lot right and then you walk up over the boardwalk and there it is there's the ocean there's the there are the dunes and it's just like wow I'm here this is where I want to be and now it's time to relax and just take it all in and enjoy it and go swimming. And uh, and you look to the right and you can see, I think it's Gloucester and Rockport down there and just a long, long stretch and view and, and the dunes. It's just it's amazing. And to me, that's like, yep, this is why I live in Massachusetts and why I love to be here. It's all wrapped up right in that experience. All right, Tom, it's been a journey. Thank you so much for coming on and, and just summarizing things. And the, thanks for hosting the podcast. Doug, it's been a real pleasure and appreciate all your questions and conversations. Thank you. Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap. What an awesome experience for me to talk with those stakeholders around Crane Beach and the trustees and to learn what they are doing with coastal adaptation. Very encouraged by their efforts, and I think there is much to learn for other coastal communities. Adaptation is truly sausage making. You hear me say this all the time, and you got to hear firsthand how these communities in Massachusetts are approaching climate adaptation. If you heard the first episode on Waysquee Beach, you see they do it a little bit differently at Crane Beach. So there's much to learn from each other. We have one more episode in this series, one focusing on North Point Beach on Martha's Vineyard. So yes, we're returning to that island. Thanks again to all those who participated in this episode, and thanks to the trustees and to the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management for funding this podcast series. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.